Hello, and welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Emily Liska, Executive Director of the Jacksonville Historical Society. This is the show to discuss, analyze, and celebrate Jacksonville's history and North Florida's history. In the first segment of tonight's show, I'll interview Cheryl Allman, who's Director of the Carpolis Manuscript Library Museum. And then in our second segment, President of the Historical Society, Harry Reagan, will interview Louis Zelenka, Senior Librarian of the Genealogy Department of our Public Libraries. First tonight, I'd like to welcome Cheryl Allman. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you very much. It's so good of you to be here. You are director of a marvelous institution here in Jacksonville, Florida, and it's not just in Jacksonville, it's actually nationwide, and that is the Carpolis Manuscript Library Museum. That is correct. Now, tell me, we were lucky enough, there are eight of these uh, nationwide, and we are lucky enough to have one of these museums in Jacksonville. Tell me why, and let's talk about the museum. Sure. The Carpolis is a, a private organization, and we have selected eight cities across the United States that were of maybe medium size, that maybe could use a little bit more help in the, I guess you'd say, cultural history area. Jacksonville is such a huge, huge city as far as... Uh, uh, audience to be served, yet there is not a lot to offer for them to look back into our history. So it made not natural sense, but of course then uh, Carpolis is my maiden name, <laughs> and so when I moved here, um, basically offered my parents that they would like me to um, help facilitate a local branch of the Carpolis Manuscript Library Museum here, and they were very excited about the idea, and we found the most gorgeous building for it, a neoclassical style architecture building between downtown and Springfield that was originally the first Church of Christ Scientist building uh, built in 1921 to 1923. In fact, we have a picture of this we might show so people will know how to find their way there, Cheryl. Tell them where that wonderful building is sure. located. Sure. It's at 101 West 1st Street at the corner of Laura Street. It's basically one block north and west of State and Maine. And it's right, in, it's, it's right at the entryway to Springfield. And I know how much the Springfield community is welcome Carpolis. In fact, how many years have you been there now? I've lost track. I believe we're on uh, 12 or 13 now. It's amazing. <laughs> and I have to say for the Jacksonville Historical Society, for us, you're just the perfect marriage of history and restoring a historic building because the building is in just beautiful condition. And, um, you know, people, when they, when they uh, go to Carpolis, Let's tell the listeners, the viewers, what they can expect to see there and just the mission of Carpolis. Sure. It is our mission to provide the audience to access to original manuscripts of historic importance. Now, these are not just local manuscripts. They could be manuscripts dealing with segments of our history as back far as actually the time of Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, and they're of worldwide interest. So we will have um, not just American um, history, but European. And it won't be just historical as far as history sense. When people think of history, they think of what they learned in school. But we have manuscripts dealing with literature, science, music, the arts, a little bit of everything. Something that you would have studied in school, that's the type of thing we like to um, display as the original documents leading up to that. I know I was recently there and, and I note right now for those people uh, who are lucky enough to, to, to be seeing this segment uh, through almost the end of June, you have a Teddy Roosevelt exhibit there right now, uh, documents and manuscripts uh, related to Teddy Roosevelt. Am I not correct? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, our youngest president, um, 43 years old at the time. And we will have that through the end of June. And then in July, we will actually have the Huguenots. That will be from July 1st to September 30th. And, of course, the Huguenots, great interest to Jacksonville residents. So all the way through July, people can see the, the, the Huguenot uh, exhibit. And that's of great interest to um, the citizens of Jacksonville because, of course, we have our own Fort Caroline here. And that was settled by the Huguenots more than half a century before the Pilgrims settled at Plymouth. Right. So all that history is so wonderfully inter interrelated with, uh, with, with what became Jacksonville, Florida exactly. one day eventually, uh, albeit many hundreds of years later. Uh, I'd like to take a look at just some of uh, the, you have more than one million original manuscripts, I understand. That's correct. Our collection is shared between all the Carpolis museums around the country. Most of the manuscripts at any one time are in protective storage. However, we have about 25 to 30 manuscripts at each museum location at one time. 
but we draw from our collection of over a million. And I'm going to say right now we have one on the screen. Now it's in much better condition than how it's, it, the viewers are seeing it from home. But Cheryl, you want to tell about this when this involves the act abolishing slavery in the U.S. or would you like, uh, this is just one of the many documents that, that Abraham Lincoln himself signed. Exactly. Well, actually, we have some even more impressive manuscripts in this, in this grouping, okay. one of them being the Emancipation Proclamation Amendment mm -hmm. that actually freed the slaves two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and we're very proud to, to have that manuscript. That's actually known as the 13th Amendment. And um, it's funny how most people celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation as freeing the slaves. And they'll just flock out to the National Archives to see this manuscript that's on display. But in reality, that was more of a political move, as some know, historians know, that that was more of a political move that Lincoln had to do to free up some slaves to fight on the side of the North. If they were to survive, then they would have their freedom. It wasn't really so, truly So here freedom. it is. You actually have that, the, the well, document we have, that did the deed. We had the one that did the deed. Yeah, Two I years understand. later, he, came, you know, he, he was able to really achieve what he wanted to achieve, and that was absolute freedom. And that is the 13th Amendment, which is called the Emancipation Proclamation Amendment that actually freed the slaves. And we actually, on the original, we did show it here in Jacksonville at one time. And you, you have such a diversity in your collection. Some of your collection, uh, one piece I know relates to Jacksonville, and we have a copy of that with us. And this was a letter written by a Union soldier who was here in Jacksonville in uh, 1863 during the Civil War, and he writes uh, to friends about his experience in Jacksonville, which now tells historians a great deal about Jacksonville in that era. And uh, that's shown right now on the screen. And uh, you want to talk any about that? It well, it's just interesting because when you come to look at the manuscripts, everybody thinks of the, the burning of Jacksonville as being the, the fire we had in the early 1900s. And then you look at these manuscripts and you realize they're talking about the burning of Jacksonville prior to that uh, around, the, around the Civil War. And, and you could just find out so many more things by looking at, at original sources. That's right. Ja uh, the, the, city of, the city of Jacksonville was literally burned to the ground on numerous occasions during the Civil War, all but burned to the ground. There right. were a few things standing. And in fact, some of those burnings, the Confederates actually were responsible for because they were trying to keep certain buildings and, and information out of Union hands. So both sides were burning our city and the outlying uh, Homes. So it, it, uh, you're exactly right. You learn so much through reading these letters uh, and documents and manuscripts. Um, there, there are also, you, again, the diversity is so great and you go through the decades and centuries. How many years did your father actually collect these manuscripts? Because you told me he's no longer collecting them. Right. He doesn't, he doesn't um, acquire new manuscripts at this time unless it's something really special and close to his heart. At this point, he's more working on maintaining the, the manuscript museums that he has. Um, but he did collect from about um, the early 80s. And I'll interrupt to the you 90s. again because we have one up again that mm -hmm. one of your father's really prizes. This is the license that Charles Lindbergh uh, uh, received from the U.S. government in order to make that a landmark flight across the Atlantic. That's correct. Uh, from um, New York to Paris. That's correct. And uh, that is. And which he stopped in Jacksonville. Afterwards, well, and, 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 he, and he did later uh, come to Jacksonville. That's yes. exactly right. right. Um, and this is quite a treasure to have in your collection. It certainly is 19, dates to 1927, and I hope I have my dates right. I should. <laughs> I better. And um, so your father collected roughly these million, and now he just looks for really the, the ones, as you say, that are close to his heart. heart. I understand. Yes, absolutely. We have so many to choose from, as, and we, we never run out of exhibits. Um, but the diversity is definitely there. As I mentioned, we have some unusual things, such as the Declaration of Spain, the Declaration of Mexico. I'm oh, I mean, sorry, Declaration. Constitution. Constitution. I apologize. Thank you. I didn't know where I was going with that. I was listening. <laughs> the Constitution of Spain and the Constitution of Mexico. Often a country in its growth years will have many revised forms of their constitution and we actually own original constitutions for these countries isn't well, that amazing it, here, it is here are the private hands in the united states it, it is indeed <laughs> and you know you have and, and you you also have pieces of the collection just to interest everybody i know uh, you have some of the Disney uh, early cartoon, early drawings. Yes, original uh, renderings, not the cells, but the original renderings. You. Yes, correct. And one you have, and it shows really the evolution of Mickey. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> because I believe the first time Mickey was sketched was in the 20s, 
and he was later sketched as late as I think the one you have here is about 1938, is it? Um, actually, I don't remember the date myself. Roughly. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. And, and there is Mickey, and it shows his evolution as he develops into the Mickey Mouse we know today. Yeah, that is a slightly more modern version because <laughs> I've seen... Others that you yes, have in your collection. Yes, that are a more unrefined versions, yes. Well, you certainly have just a dynamic collection. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the other services you offer because since you've been director, you have branched out. Not only do you show these, as you say, you have endless exhibits to show at Carpalis because of these one million plus documents, and they're so creative. The ideas you come up with, come up with the, the exhibits you put together. Um, let's tell people some other services of Carpalis, sure. and these are uh, things you brought uniquely to Jacksonville. Absolutely, you bring up Mickey Mouse. You, <laughs> you're going my direction already. Because you have started something called Sprinkles Children's Museum. Am I That's correct? That's correct. Tell about. Let's talk about that. Well, my love is children. I love children. So one thing I was missing as director of the Carpalis Museum is working with the young children. Now we do have field trips all the time. But really, the field trips that benefit from the visit are third grade and up because they're of reading age. They need to be able to read and really read of content to enjoy the, the visit to the museum. Well, that left out a whole huge audience of ages one to third grade. And that's the age I just love to work with. And um, so I was looking for something to offer to do at the museum. And, and a number of people talked me into becoming a clown of which oh. I did, for the, I've been doing as Sprinkles the this. Clown. I didn't know that you oh, were Sprinkles my goodness. the Clown. Yes. <laughs> okay. And I did it as something to offer when, when families and um, field trips with younger kids would come into the museum. I would, I would be the clown. And it's funny because actually, to be honest with you, a little secret here, when I was a child, I did not like clowns because from my generation, we went through that period where they did all the sad clown artwork and all the negative clown side of things. And so I didn't see that positive side that, that is coming out now. Clowns are birthday party fun. It's, you know, more positive association. But I was one of those. I didn't fear clowns like a lot of people do, but I just didn't care for them. So when I was talked into considering becoming a clown to be more approachable for the children, I decided I would start my own philosophy on clowning. And so we have this whole different philosophy than, than everybody else in town. We don't do the white face and just many different things that make the clown more approachable. And it's really worked and, and it was wonderful. So we just took that a little further and we had space in the Carpalis Museum on the whole first floor. And we turned it into, into a full-scale 5,000 square foot children's museum. And when can children come to that museum? And it's a museum that's heavy play, as I understand. That's Lots right. Of play. It's play and learn at the same time. It's a touch-me museum instead of hands-off. And, <laughs> and, and you also just opened a similar museum to this in, in, Mandar in yes. the Mandarin area at Mandarin Landing Shopping Center. That's at, correct. Uh, just north of 295 in San Jose. Absolutely. Very good. And tell me, what are the hours of both offices? Operations. Yes, they're, they're actually different hours. Our downtown museum is open from 10 o'clock to 1 o'clock, Tuesday through Saturday, year-round. However, in the summer, during the months of June and July, we stay till 3 on the weekdays. Now, the Mandarin location is open from 10 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday, year-round. And there is a very small fee for the Sprinkles Children's Museum, I understand. Yeah, it's three fifty, which is about half price of the... Uh, traditional rates for museums across um, Florida, actually across the country. Uh, we truly believe in when you're a not-for-profit organization, you really want to hit the audiences that uh, these families with large, you know, large numbers of children in their family to go out to, to a museum for the day can be very um, rough on the budget and we want to be there for everybody. And I know for a fact that children love it. Before we go, two things. I want to get your website up and I want to tell people about visiting the actual Carpulous, Carpulous uh, manuscript a Library Museum, what your hours are, and make a special note that it's free to the public. Absolutely. The Carpalus is free, and it will always be free. Um, so br bring, the, bring, the, bring the family, bring tourists. Um, it's open 10 to, five, excuse me, 10 to 3, Tuesday through Saturday. Cheryl. We're never open Monday, Sunday or Monday, so it's easy to remember all the museums. Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 3. Thank you so much. What a treasure you have here in Jacksonville on behalf of the Historical Society. Thank, Thank you. you for what you do for, ja for history in our area. Thank you very much for including me. I appreciate that. You're so welcome. When we come back, Harry Reagan, President of the Historical Society, and Louis Zelenka, Senior Librarian in the Genealogy Department, will talk about genealogy. <laughs>